Are you a dedicated Micro Terrors listener? Then become one of the terrified by joining the Micro Terrors fan club. All members receive a welcome pack in the mail that includes a collectible Micro Terrors trading card, a Micro Terrors bookmark, printable games, coloring pages, and a personalized Micro Terror story with you as the main character. With two different membership levels to choose from, you can also enjoy commercial free episodes, read stories a week early, participate in polls, receive complimentary paperback copies of all Micro Terror books in the mail when they release, as well as enjoy discounted pricing on previously released books, and communicate directly with Micro Terror's writer and creator, Scott Donnelly. Become one of the terrified today at microterrors.com. Welcome to Micro Terrors. Scary stories for kids. Where it's always the spooky season. Full of chills. Thrills. And spine tingling spooks. Micro Terrors are family friendly frights for those ages 8 and up. And while our stories are for younger ears, we are still talking about things that go bump in the night. And some children may not be able to handle what others can. Parental consent is recommended. Now, for tonight's Micro Terror. The Grove City Werewolf, Part 4. Written by Scott Donnelly. Sean had stopped working in the attic. He cowered behind the tall, antique mirror, listening to chaos unfold downstairs. The crashing sounds, the snarls and growls. Sean knew it had to be another werewolf attack. He closed his eyes tightly and tried to control his breathing. Thinking of poor Reese. As the house below him went silent, he waited for what felt like hours, but was maybe only five minutes. He didn't hear Reese. He didn't hear Bongo. He didn't hear a monster. He thought of his aunt and uncle next door and wondered if he'd be able to make a break for it, to make a push for help. Otherwise, he'd be trapped in the attic. Sean came out from behind the mirror and crept across the attic floor. The wooden planks creaked beneath him as if the house was groaning in pain. He slowly made his way down the steps of the pull-down ladder and cautiously turned the corner and into the kitchen where he assumed the chaotic struggle had taken place. He was right. On the floor, bunched up against the far wall, was Reese. He was surrounded by broken glass and covered in deep lacerations. Sean covered his mouth, trying not to scream or throw up, and spun around, rushing through the house for the front door. He threw it open and was stopped dead in his tracks by Jeff, the mailman, who was setting a large package down on the front steps. Jeff, just as startled as Sean was, jumped back and grabbed his chest. Whoa! Jeff gasped. I didn't know you, you were... I didn't expect... He looked next door to his aunt and uncle's house. Are you in the right house? Behind Sean, echoing through the house, was the sound of a door opening. The back door in the kitchen, perhaps? Sean looked back to Jeff, panicked. The werewolf is here! Sean exclaimed. It killed Reese! It's... Suddenly, Jeff was attacked from behind. But it wasn't from the sharp claws or razor-like teeth of a werewolf. It was from Reese, smacking him over the back of the head with a splintered, broken broomstick. Jeff crumbled to the ground, and Sean watched the mailman fall unconscious. Sean looked up at Reese, who was smiling maliciously. The deep lacerations that covered his body all healed before Sean's very eyes, like a magic trick. Sean felt weak, faint. It was all too much for him. His eyes rolled into the back of his head, and he collapsed to the floor just inside of the house. When Sean opened his eyes, he was back in the attic, laying on an old mattress atop a pile of musty sheets and blankets. 
His eyes opened in heavy blinks, his surroundings coming back to him as blurry images and muffled noises, almost as if he were underwater. He heard something metal clanging. He heard scampering and thrashing. Sean rolled over, opening up his vision to the entirety of the attic. And what he saw made him sit up as quickly as he could and press his back against the wall. It was the werewolf, the vicious beast that had been terrorizing Grove City. It paced back and forth, puffing angrily within the claustrophobic confines of a shimmering silver cage. Next to the cage on its side sat the box that Jeff had sat on the porch. It was open, with smaller boxes and instructions from inside of it pouring out. Sean could see that the instructions were on how to put together the large silver cage that now took up a good portion of the attic, in the exact spot where Reese wanted Sean to start cleaning up. The werewolf, noticing that Sean was now awake, lowered its head and leered at him from across the attic with its piercing yellow eyes. It snarled, thick saliva dripping from between its teeth. Oh, stop it, a voice said. Reese stepped out from the shadows, from behind the antique mirror, and stood in front of it as he smacked the silver cage as hard as he could. Bongo, his loyal dog, was at his side. The werewolf cowered and slunk back into a sitting position. Sean stood up slowly and stepped off the mattress. You were, you were dead, Sean trembled. I, I saw you in the kitchen. <laughs> I've been dead for a long time, Reese said with a sarcastic chuckle, hearkening back to their earlier conversations. Uh, undead, to be exact. The word undead bounced around briefly in Sean's head before he landed on another word. Vampire. Sean now noticed something else. Reese didn't display a reflection in the tall antique mirror he now stood in front of. Sean's heart skipped a beat. Of course, he thought, werewolves and vampires, one of the world's oldest rivalries was playing out right here in Grove City. You look like you have a lot of questions, Reese said. Don't worry, you're not in danger. Jeff, on the other hand… Reese turned back to the beast. It cowered lower and then began to transform. Its fur receded, as did its snout and teeth. Within seconds, Jeff was the one within the silver cage, crouched and afraid in torn clothing. He stood up and grit his teeth, taking a step forward but careful not to come into contact with the silver bars of the cage. He glared at Reese. You killed my brother! Jeff growled. Reese smirked. <laughs> I wish it could have been sooner, but I must give credit where credit is due. You and your brother were hard to track down. Nice choice by staying in the shadows all these years. If it wasn't for Bongo, I wouldn't have had the help needed to really narrow you guys down. A dog can always track a dog. <coughs> Jeff's breathing picked up, his eyes narrowed. <laughs> I didn't realize losing him would send you into this sort of animalistic rage, though. Reese laughed. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm stopping you now before you hurt someone else. How many people would have to lose their lives because you're upset, Jeff? Jeff slunk back further into the cage, shadows crawling over his face. We both can't live here, Jeff. Werewolves and vampires, we just don't mix. You know that, Reese said. But after striking up a relationship with my loyal Bongo here, who effortlessly helped me to snuff you two out, I began to wonder what if. What if a vampire could domesticate a werewolf and use it to his advantage? What if, under the right circumstances, a vampire and a werewolf could be the ultimate team-up of horrors? Sean just stood back, watching and listening. At first, he believed Reese when he told him he wasn't in any danger. But now, as he watched Reese discussing teaming up two monsters for a reign of horror, he wasn't so sure. What would those horrors consist of? Sean was convinced now that he was in danger, just as all of Grove City was. Sean tried to quietly shuffle himself toward the attic door, but stopped when a cackle from Reese sent a cold shiver through his body. You might not be able to see me in the mirror, but I can see you, Reese said. 
He spun around and faced Sean, now bearing a set of fangs and black eyes. He hissed and raised his arms up. It was now or never. Sean bolted for the open attic door and dropped down into the house. He didn't stick the landing and crumbled to the floor. Scrambling to his feet, he raced for the kitchen, but a heavy gust of wind whirled up beside him, cutting him off, and manifested itself as Reese, his fangs still showing, his eyes still as black as night. Sean stopped and looked around for a weapon or anything to defend himself, but came up empty. I've lived here a long time, Sean. This is my town. Reese hissed. And now, with the werewolf population in Grove City under my control, I don't see why I can't help myself to a celebratory feast. <laughs> Reese raised his hands up limply in front of his body. I think I'll start by tapping your neck, he malevolently said. That's always a classy move. As Reese took a step toward Sean, a knock on the back door shattered the tension. Sean prayed it was salvation. Reese was annoyed by the interruption. Bongo, however, raced into the room and wagged his tail vigorously at the back door. Reese's entire body turned around as if he were on a swivel and faced the door. After a moment of unnerving silence, Bongo's tail stopped wagging and he backed away. The door then blasted in off its hinges, crashing into Reese and knocking him to the floor. Two large werewolves stood intimidatingly in the doorway and then made their way in. Sean backed up and hid underneath the kitchen table. One of the werewolves, heaving its body up and down with each massive breath it took, grabbed Reese by the neck and slammed him into the wall. The second werewolf grabbed the closest wooden chair and smashed it into a hundred pieces on the floor. Only keeping one of the splintered legs in its grasp. Everything happened so fast, Reese barely had time to react. With one last hiss from the vampire, the werewolf plunged the broken chair leg deep into Reese's chest. As, of course, a wooden stake through the heart was the only way to eliminate such a threat. Reese's body turned black like ash and spilled to the ground in a dusty cloud. Both werewolves then began to transform back to their human forms right in front of Sean. When he saw who they were, he was stunned at first, surprised, but then it all made sense. If you're bitten by a werewolf, you become a werewolf. Teresa Breckenridge stood in the kitchen, along with a bearded man sporting a Skylark's toys and comics ball cap. Teresa extended her hand and helped Sean out from underneath the table and to his feet. She smiled. You don't look that surprised, she said. You both were, were attacked by a, a werewolf, Sean said. Now you are werewolves. Teresa nodded, as did Darren Neff, the humble owner of Skylarks. I was pretty mad when Jeff attacked me, but now I understand why he did, Darren said. Being the last of his kind in the area, he knew there was a chance of permanent extinction. He was recruiting help, a future. And honestly, Darren said, looking his body over, this is pretty darn cool. I mean, who doesn't dream of being a werewolf? The morgue is going to realize our bodies are gone soon enough, Teresa said to Darren, but also for Sean's sake. We need to get Jeff and leave town to settle somewhere else, somewhere safe where no one will recognize our faces. Jeff's locked in a silver cage, Sean said, but, but I can help get him out. Teresa smiled. Thank you, Sean. That would be wonderful. You saved me. Sean said, let me save you guys. The next morning, a new mystery around Grove City began to spread like wildfire. Two corpses from the morgue, both victims of werewolf attacks, had disappeared, and the locals now began to fear the walking dead, zombies, while others were closer than they thought, suggesting the two corpses were now werewolves themselves there was simply just no sign of them. And Sean knew why. Teresa Breckenridge and Darren Neff had left town along with Jeff the mailman. He wasn't sure where they would end up, but he knew their goal was to live peacefully somewhere, hidden away from any other vampiric threats. 
Uncle Curtis and Aunt Jade remained oblivious to the horrors that had transpired right next door to them. And although Reese's sudden absence was certainly strange to them, they just assumed it was another example of a young man moving on to bigger and better things with his life. It's that internet, Curtis vaguely said, without much explanation behind his Reese vanishing theory, but it was enough to satisfy him and Jade. When Sean's parents picked him up, they thanked Curtis and Jade for their hospitality and said their goodbyes. Sean settled into the back seat of the family car for the drive home before eventually heading down to North Carolina, forever planning to keep the identities of the Grove City werewolves a secret. After a couple of weeks in North Carolina, Sean received a copy of the Grove City Messenger in the mail from his uncle with a handwritten note that said, Thought you'd like this to remember your time here in Grove City. Fun fact, the sightings seem to have stopped now. There was a front-page article written by Andrea Cordell titled, Grove City, Home of Monsters? Skimming through the article, Sean read about the sightings, the mystery and intrigue that surrounded the recent werewolf activity, plus a whole slew of other unknown horrors that may have lurked just beneath the surface of the town. And it seemed that Andrea really did her research on the local ominous goings-on, because, based on what Sean could tell from the article, Grove City may have had even more than just a werewolf and vampire problem. Now, Sean was very curious about the ghosts that were said to haunt the Grove City Library after hours. But that would have to be a story for another time. The End Micro Terrors would like to thank Darren Neff from Skylark's Toys and Comics, Teresa Breckenridge from the Grove City Visitor Center, Andrea and Deborah Cordell from the Grove City Messenger, Mike Strasser from Strasser's Ice Cream Pop and Candy Shop, Tyler and Heidi Walker from Tammy's Pizza, and Casey Cox and Meredith Wickham from the Grove City Library for letting us use their likeness and mention their businesses in our story. By the way, there are no werewolves or vampires in Grove City, Ohio. That we are aware of. I'm your Micro Terrors narrator, Darren Marlar. From me and Scott Donnelly, we hope you have a very happy and safe Halloween. Thank you for listening to Micro Terrors. Join us each Saturday for another scary story. For more fun, visit our website at microterrors.com where you can get the latest Micro Terrors news, read fun facts about each story, sign up for our monthly newsletter, and even send in your own scary story for us to tell. Plus, you can become one of the terrified by joining the fan club at microterrors.com to enjoy exclusive perks like reading stories a week early, receiving complimentary books, and communicating directly with Micro Terrors writer and creator Scott Donnelly. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram using the handle at Micro Terrors. I hope you'll join us again soon for Micro Terrors, scary stories for kids. Hey, mystery seekers, love spooky stories? Dive in to Creepy Clubhouse. Each month, you'll receive a box packed with books and gifts right to your doorstep, featuring a new spooky or mysterious theme every month. From aliens to Bigfoot to the Bermuda Triangle, perfect for young listeners like you who crave thrilling adventures. Exclusive from Micro Terrors listeners, use promo code TERROR10 to get 10% off your first box. Visit CreepyClubhouse.com and then use TERROR10 as your promo code and start your spooky journey today. Join the club. Embrace the creepy.